The New Englanders are a people of God settled in those which were once the devil's territories, and it may easily be supposed that the devil was exceedingly disturbed when he perceived such a people encountered here accomplishing the promise of old made unto our blessed Jesus, that he should have the utmost parts of the earth for his possession. Cotton Mather, Wonders of the Invisible World. I have indeed set myself to countermine the whole plot of the devil against New England, in every branch of it, as far as one of my darkness can comprehend such a work of darkness. Cotton Mather, Wonders of the Invisible World. Welcome to Witch Hunt, the podcast that brings you the most in-depth Salem Witch Hunt coverage. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. Today, we present our first Salem Witch Hunt 101 episode. Sarah and I are both descendants of people involved in the Salem Witch Hunt. And we're glad you've joined us as we explore every aspect of the event that reshaped their world. In this episode, we present an overview of the Witch Hunt on the whole. Look for us to dive into specific people, events, and topics in upcoming episodes. The Salem Witch Hunt is known throughout the world, but is one of the least typical hunts in England or in New England. For more on those other witch hunts, listen to our episodes on witchcraft accusations in England, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. The Salem Witch Hunt was by far New England's largest witch hunt. The number of accused during Salem was greater than the total from all prior witch trials in New England. 156 accused was even more people than were accused during King James VI of Scotland's North Berwick witch hunt. 19 hanged matches the total hanged in the infamous Chelmsford, England witch hunt of 1645, with six additional deaths, one depressing, and five to poor jail conditions. Salem's total of 25 dead edges out Chelmsford's total of 23. In the parlance of witch trial researchers, what happened in Massachusetts in 1692-3 was a witch panic, a witch hunt that grew so large so quickly that the usual rules of witch hunts were thrown out the window. Rather than rounding up only the usual suspects, anyone and everyone was fair game for the witch hunters. So what preconditions helped make such a large-scale operation possible? Who were the key players, and what were the key moments? We will answer these questions and many more during the Salem Witch Hunt series, and you will enjoy progressing through the story in what will be the most in-depth exploration of the Salem Witch Hunt ever aired. Today, we kick off the series with a big picture view of the proceedings. Between February 1692 and May 1692, at least 156 individuals were formally accused of witchcraft, and many others were named but not prosecuted for witchcraft. It began with the afflictions of two girls in one small town, but it snowballed until 25 were dead, 19 by hanging, one pressed to death, and five died in jail. Over 1,400 people are named in records of the Salem Witch Hunt, and each of those individuals had family, friends, and neighbors who would have heard the stories or even attended some proceedings, which we know were observed by throngs. Everything started in a small village of some 500 to 550 people including about 200 adults, and it spread to involve suspects from 25 communities from Boston North to Wells, Maine. We call it the Salem Witch Hunt, but it may be more accurate to think of it as the Great Massachusetts Witch Hunt or even the New England Witch Hunt of 1692-3. What sets Salem apart is not just size, but also the fact that victims were accused indiscriminately, and therefore the jails were full of unexpected individuals. If you've seen or read The Crucible, you're already familiar with some of the basics of Salem. But The Crucible is also the origin and proliferator of many inaccuracies, myths, and misconceptions. The Crucible is not a great source for accurate historical details. Neither are Bewitched, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, or WGN America's Salem, though they are entertaining and worth watching in their own right. The real Salem witch hunt was a lot more complicated and involved a cast of thousands. After you rewatch The Crucible. You know you want to do that now. Try watching Three Sovereigns for Sarah to understand the emotions they felt. At a time when the total population of New England was measured in the tens of thousands, a very large chunk was affected by the witch hunt. Tituba has had a complicated legacy. 
While made an icon for women of color by recently passed Maurice Conde and others, she has also been accused of teaching children voodoo, which she never practiced, and she has been blamed for intensifying the witch hunt by testifying that a diabolical conspiracy was afoot, with numerous witches involved. In truth, Titiba was an indigenous woman, perhaps Arawak or Carib. She is not known to have practiced any magic except for baking a witch cake on the instructions of English woman Mary Sibley. Indeed, Titiba never taught magic to a group of girls, and there is no evidence such a circle of girls ever existed. Another key difference between the crucible and reality is that John Proctor and Abigail Williams had no love affair. In reality, John was in his 60s and Abigail was 11 years old. She did not work for him. She did not live with him. Her home was the parsonage with her uncle, Samuel Paris. We aren't going to give you the crucible treatment here. Every fact we detail here comes straight from a primary source document, a trustworthy book, a scholarly article. Our bibliography is linked in the show description. Use it to continue your own research after this episode. The witch hunt began in a small farming community adjoining a bustling port town. It spread to dozens of towns and threatened to engulf all of New England, with victims from Boston to Maine, and may have been responsible for triggering a copycat event in Connecticut. Indeed, the events in Salem could well be called the Massachusetts or New England witch trials. Salem is used as a reference to the location of the Court of Oyer and Terminer Proceedings in 1692. The episode started in late 1691 by the old calendar, which ended in March, but early 1692 by the new calendar, which adopted January 1st as the start of the new year. Dates were often written with both years. The immediate process continued until May 1693, but victims and their heirs were still petitioning for restitution into the 1750s. A series of legal complaints and arrests, which began under an interim colonial government, was followed by a series of trials and executions after a new royal governor took office in May. Then the long process of reckoning began. A complicated set of circumstances provided the fuel for the witch hunt. A mysterious illness provided the spark. Unfortunate legal decisions enabled the spread of the fire of accusation. Through questionable legal procedures and the overturning of precedents, men, women, and children were prosecuted for a crime nobody has ever been guilty of, covenanting with the devil and using his powers to inflict illness, injury, and the death on others. The Salem witch hunt was largely the prosecution of women by men. Of the 156 people accused of witchcraft, 117 were female and 39 were male. More than half of these men were closely connected to women accused before them, and the others were guilty of other sins in the public eye. 25 of the 31 convicted or pressed to death were women. During the witch hunt, at least 24 persons accused of witchcraft died, along with the infant daughter of a suspect. 14 women and 5 men were hanged, not burned. One man was pressed to death with stones, and at least five people died in jail, including Sarah Good's infant daughter. No one tried by the court of Oyer and Terminer in 1692 was found innocent. The prosecution was 27 and 0. There was a lot of people involved in the Salem witch hunt. You have the 156 plus who were accused of witchcraft. Then there were at least 73 afflicted persons. Then there were hundreds of witnesses and accusers and 31 people filed complaints. Dozens of men served as jurors. The full list have not survived, but each court session required grand juries and trial juries. In addition, women served on juries of midwives who inspected female suspects' bodies for witch marks and teats. Dozens of law enforcement officers were involved, including constables, marshals, sheriffs, and jail keepers. There were nine judges on the court of Oyer and Terminer, plus one replacement judge. Then there was the Superior Court of Judicature with one new judge, Thomas Danforth, making a total of 11 judges spending time on the trial courts. In addition, there were local magistrates involved in many of the interrogations. Others served the courts as king's attorney or secretary, recorded depositions, or hosted magistrates and suspects in their inns. And then throw in all of their families, and you see that thousands of people were involved in the witch hunt. And so we can safely say Salem was by far the largest series of witchcraft trials to occur in British North America. Though many witch hunts in Europe, Africa, and Asia have resulted in more deaths, 
None has matched Salem in terms of public interest. What is our endless fascination with Salem? Considering that there were European witch hunts that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of people, why are we fixated on Salem? Why has only one city earned the title Witch City? One thing is that there has been a steady stream of literature about the Salem witch hunt since 1692. Another is that it was English America's only large-scale witch panic, so it's natural that Americans have latched onto it. Another reason for widespread interest is that so many people have been able to trace their family trees back to Salem. Given the large number of people involved in the Salem witch hunt, a large portion of the U.S. population has a familial connection, as do many people living abroad. If you have family from New England, especially from Essex County, Massachusetts, there's a good chance that you are related to somebody who was involved. If you're related to an accused person, you are probably also related to someone on the prosecution side of things. And many people had mixed records. My ancestor, Joseph Hutchinson, started as an accuser, but ended up defending Rebecca Nurse, Sarah's ancestor, and testifying that one of the afflicted girls was faking. Before we dig into the events of the Salem witch hunt, we will look at what a witch hunt is, beginning with a definition of magic. In episode 70, Marion Gibson on Witchcraft, A History in 13 Trials, Marion Gibson defined magic. I think magic is a force which cannot be explained by other factors such as science, rationality, observable physical or material changes of that kind. But it's more than that, really. It's what people choose to define as magic. So, our working definition of magic is the use of occult or supernatural means to manipulate natural objects or forces. Many magical practitioners today believe, as their predecessors indeed believed before them, they can do this to affect positive change. So then, what is a witch? Malcolm Gaskell had answers in episode 5, called Malcolm Gaskell on the Ruin of All Witches. Just that question, what is a witch? It's such an incredibly a multifaceted and mutable concept. So again, you have the biblical witch and you have the legal witch. The witch is someone who forms a covenant with the devil, but how do you prove that? But in the community, the witch is somebody who really who was trying to harm you, your household, your domestic interests, your livestock, your crops, and very particularly, and this is really important for the history of witchcraft, your children. Marion Gibson also defined the witch in episode 70. The witch is a very movable thing, but often defined as an enemy. So one of the places that the witch fits into society, even over such a long historical period, is that they are a very useful enemy. Importantly, for New Englanders in the 17th century, witches were people who had familiarity with Satan. It was Satan who gave them their powers. He, in turn, received limited power from God to punish the sinful and test the righteous. While many today self-identify as witches, the word witch means something entirely different for many people, as it did in New England in the 17th century. A witch here is someone who is imagined to manipulate occult forces for sinister purposes, making a person's luck go bad, injuring or sickening people, both children and adults, harming livestock, crops, and food stores, right up to torture and even murder. In popular belief, a witch was someone who came by their powers naturally. But in prevailing religious beliefs of Christians in the early modern period, a witch obtained her powers from the devil, the supernatural entity who roamed the earth in physical form and could shapeshift and use optical illusions to deceive. The witch then was ordinarily female, though the proportion of males was not entirely insignificant coming in at 15 to 20 percent overall in Europe and the North American colonies. While women and men could both be witches, men were often portrayed in supervisory roles, receiving coveted titles like wizard and conjurer in Salem. Warlocks were a Scottish invention and are not referenced in the records of the Salem Witch Hunt, the collection of existing Salem Witch Hunt primary source documents. Women were witches largely because the belief was that women were the weaker vessel, more susceptible to temptation, and would easily succumb to Satan's wiles. The toxic masculinity in the demonologies or witch hunting guides was off the charts, especially in the infamous and notorious Malleus Maleficarum, 
The Hammer of Witches by Heinrich Cromer, a raging hater of women, whom he considered so inferior to men, lustful, deceitful, unfaithful even unto God. Today, witch hunts continue, involving real fear of witchcraft, which is still prevalent in all nations. These witch hunts result in violence, ostracization, banishment, and murder. Women are the predominant victims, but children, the elderly, persons with albinism, and persons with disabilities are frequently targeted, regardless of gender. In most places, these human rights abuses do not come from the government, but from family and neighbors. However, there are nations where witchcraft and sorcery are still prosecuted through courts. Even when not prosecuted for witchcraft, so called witches often end up behind bars or exiled to witch camps for their own safety, or so authorities claim. According to the United Nations, over 2,000 cases are reported annually, and that figure may be drastically understated and doesn't account for the thousands of children who have been abandoned and forced into homelessness and self-dependency at early ages. For more on this issue, visit our organization's website at endwitchhunts.org and visit the other links in the show description. The witches of the century... 17th century New England could use maleficium, harmful magic designed to cause injury, death, and destruction to people and livestock. Witches could also shapeshift, cast spells, mix potions, use charms, stare people down with the evil eye, control weather, sink ships, and use image magic. In the case of the Salem witch hunt, witches in New England could also fly on poles and attend the devil's sabbaths. Given our working definitions of magic and witchcraft, a witch hunt, in the sense that we are using the term, is a search for or prosecution of persons believed to have caused harm supernaturally. In this sense, witch hunts have occurred in societies all around the globe for thousands of years. And for the past 250 years or more, the term witch hunt has also been a byword for prosecutorial access. To really qualify as a witch hunt metaphorically, though, there needs to be a fictional or exaggerated threat, and people's lives, freedom, and reputations are harmed by the actions of the witch hunters. Examples include the Red Scare in the early 20th century, McCarthyism in the 1950s, and the ongoing Satanic Panic. So what stands out about the Salem witch hunt and what sets it apart? While witch hunts have occurred everywhere and continue to occur, Salem stands out as the most culturally significant witch hunt ever. One thing that makes the Salem witch hunt stand out among New England and indeed British witch hunts is the size and scope. The indiscriminate nature of accusations makes Salem a unique experience in American history. People at the highest levels of society were named as witches. There's also the fact that this episode began with multiple afflicted people, unlike other episodes in New England, and the accusations spread as the affliction did. So much attention has been paid to the afflicted people as central in this affair, but I think we need to focus on the people around them, the ones who filed the complaints for them. The cause of the affliction is not as significant as the reasons why non-afflicted individuals would make witchcraft accusations in response. More than 150 people were named. Had the court of Uyer and Terminator tried all of them, they may all have been hanged. So they all faced that terror in the dungeons where they were chained to prevent their specters from roaming. As more and more people were hanged, that terror must have risen beyond panic levels. The Salem witch hunt was much larger than any other American witch hunt in every way. Only a handful of times in New England did you have more than two people accused of witchcraft and tried simultaneously. In fact, there were only two witch hunts in New England that resulted in more than two convictions. The Hartford Witch Panic of 1662-3 resulted in four convictions, and the Salem Witch Hunt 30 years later resulted in 30. The Stanford Fairfield Witch Hunt of 1692 yielded multiple accusations, but resulted in only one conviction, and that was overturned. Three decades of progress were overturned with the admission of spectral evidence by the Salem Court. Since the end of the Hartford Witch Panic, New England courts had not accepted this testimony. Indeed, multiple witnesses had been required to testify to the same event, meaning two or more people would have to see the same specter at the same time in order for the event to be admitted as evidence. 
But the judges of the court of Oyer and Terminer found a way around this. By having the afflicted persons in the courtroom with everyone else, everyone in the room became a witness to the afflictions in action. And for some reason, nobody on the court ever seriously doubted the afflicted person's ability to identify the people behind the shapes they saw. True. There was debate about whether they saw the real person or an imposter, Satan in disguise. But there wasn't much debate or questioning of the afflicted person's veracity and spectral acuity. The court made exceptions to some other rules as well. Accusers were not required to post bond, as was customary to show they were earnest about their accusations. This allowed individuals to make numerous complaints. In the 36 years before Salem, Massachusetts hanged only one witch that was a usual suspect. She was Goody Glover, an Irish woman and Gaelic speaker, hanged in November of 1688. What caused the Salem witch hunt? Fear caused the Salem witch hunt. Plain and simple, the fear of witches was real and still is for many people around the world. This fear is so potent that it leads people to take drastic actions they would never otherwise take. It can be compared to the level of fear of terrorists experienced by Americans on 9-11. Witchcraft represented an existential threat, as did London's whims. At the time the Salem witch hunt occurred, there was also real fear around whether the Massachusetts Bay Colony would survive as a godly colony, to use their term for those practicing the Congregationalist faith better known as Puritanism. London had revoked the Massachusetts Charter in 1684. King William issued a new charter in October 1691, but that charter did not take effect until the new governor arrived in Massachusetts in May 1692. And that new charter would force Massachusetts to tolerate religious beliefs and practices other than mainline New England Puritanism. So long as they were Protestant, people of any religious affiliation could now vote, effectively ending the Puritan theocracy that had been in place since 1629. At a time when Cotton Mather was predicting the literal end of the world was near, the world really did end for the Puritans after a fashion. Many factors contributed to an atmosphere of terror in New England in 1692. There was economic crisis, war, refugees, bad weather, epidemics, loss of self-identity as a religious model for the world, political uncertainty, religious strife, growing pains, continued preaching on the devil and witches, and more. A lot of preconditions were present, which created a ripe atmosphere for a witch hunt. It was the economy, stupid. The Massachusetts economy crisis of the 1690s meant people were struggling to get by. To this day, economic uncertainty remains a key driver of witch hunts. When you aren't doing well, you look for people to blame. War lay behind the economic woes. King Philip's War was, per capita, the bloodiest and costliest war in American history. And now, King William's War was being fought on New England's frontiers. As the front lines advanced, ever closer to the heart of Massachusetts settlements, fear of Native Americans became a familiar refrain, visible in some Salem witch hunt testimony. As one town in Maine or New Hampshire fell after the other to the combined forces, of the French and the Wabanaki Confederacy, the war still remained far enough removed from Salem, just far enough that it was not a constant preoccupation of the people of Salem and surrounding communities. Thus, it was a pressing enough concern to cause fear, consternation, and the desire to have revenge on the colony's enemies. As refugees from the North and East fled to Essex County, the northernmost county in Massachusetts, fear was heightened eventually requiring a release of pressure. Disease was another factor. As COVID has left a deep emotional scar on the world today, outbreaks of smallpox and other communicable diseases left deep scars on the people of colonial New England. Like today, people wanted answers to what caused the outbreaks. And such an outbreak had occurred in 1690, following a disastrous military expedition to Canada when hundreds of men returned home sick. The town of Andover blamed Martha Carrier and her family for bringing the smallpox there that year. Weather also contributed to a gloomy atmosphere in 1692, which happened to fall within the Maunder Minimum, 
an especially cold period of the Little Ice Age. From the start of settlement, Orthodox New England Congregationalism or Puritanism had never actually been the complete monopoly its adherents intended to create in the so-called New World. Even in the early years of Massachusetts settlements, dissenters were being exiled from the colony. Later conflicts would emerge with Quakers, Baptists, Anglicans, and anyone else not following the official line. And the Puritan orthodoxy was itself no stranger to division, such as the controversy about the halfway covenant, which put individual churches at odds with one another and even internally. Over the generations, church membership had declined, and ministers believed Christians were backsliding into sinful ways. The halfway covenant was a more liberal church membership policy intended to allow grandchildren of church members to be baptized whether or not the children's parents had made a public confession of faith and signed the church covenant. It, in effect, made baptized people halfway members of the church with the privilege of having their children baptized without, but without the right to take communion. This new way of allowing more children to be baptized did not sit well with many ministers and other leaders who wanted congregants to stand before the church members and speak of their conversion experience in order to gain access to the sacraments. These individuals wanted their churches to be composed of born-again or regenerate Christians. They did not want unregenerate people taking advantage of sacraments with unclean hearts. In other words, they wanted assurance their churches were made up of God's elect, his chosen people. Thanks to New England's congregational system, each church chose independently whether to adopt the halfway covenant or not. For decades, many of the leading churches opposed the move. However, by the end of the 17th century, four-fifths of the churches had adopted the halfway covenant. The church in Salem adopted the covenant in 1654, but when the Salem Village Church was gathered in 1689, Minister Samuel Parris and the powerful Putnam family opposed the new covenant and required proof of regeneracy. On top of all these factors, there was great political uncertainty. The very fate of the Puritan experiment lay in the balance. In 1629, Massachusetts Bay Colony was issued a charter, which allowed the company to establish a government. This enabled the creation of government by the so-called godly, which executed Quakers and drove antinomians out of the colony. These extremist actions and others did not sit well with England, and King Charles II revoked the charter in 1684. In 1686, King James II installed a new royal governor to look after all of England's northern American colonies from Connecticut to Maine. This new royal super colony, the Dominion of New England, was lorded over by Edmund Andros, who forced the New England Puritans to tolerate other Protestant religious sects and used Puritan meeting houses for Anglican services. The Dominion was expanded in 1688 to include New York and New Jersey and was dissolved in 1689 when King William and Queen Mary ascended to the throne of England Scotland and Ireland, etc., etc. Which they actually wrote on documents. You see that in many of the court documents from Salem. Uh, King and Queen of England, Scotland, and Ireland, etc., etc. It just wasn't worth writing it all out. But Massachusetts leaders replaced the Dominion temporarily with their own interim government of their pre-1686 boundaries, which included Maine. This interim government was replaced by the Charter of 1691, which was implemented beginning in May 1692. So there's this air of mystery that hangs around the Salem Witch Trials. But few big unanswered questions remained. Most have been answered. Despite us knowing all the facts we've outlined already, one common misconception about the witch hunt is that we don't know what caused it. We don't, do we? What we actually do. Well, what was it then? It was all those things we just discussed. Warfare, an economic crisis, disease, weather, religious strife, political uncertainty, decades of neighborly disputes, etc. But what ailed the afflicted persons? Theories, many of them discredited but still widely believed, unfortunately, include ergotism, encephalitis, meningitis, epilepsy, sexual abuse, sleep paralysis, conversion disorder, 
mass psychogenic illness, PTSD, other biological explanations, or just plain fraud. I read that the afflicted were in fits in court, enduring nightmares, but calm as anyone else in between. That's what was written about them, and there are a couple of theories on that. The afflicted persons were perpetuating willful fraud, or perhaps they were legitimately terrified whenever they were in the presence of the people who they believed were harming them. Despite what you may read on Wikipedia, one thing we know for sure is that the afflicted did not present the symptoms of ergotism, which include both convulsive and gangrenous effects. The fits described by observers of the afflicted people were not described as seizures or epilepsy, which were well known to people of the 17th century. The symptoms don't match encephalitis, Lyme disease, or meningitis. Some have proposed other physical ailments, while others believe a psychogenic illness such as conversion disorder was involved. With conversion disorder, the subject's mind converts psychological distress into physiological conditions. Given the conditions we have discussed already, especially the warfare, you can understand there were many traumatized individuals and widespread fear. While it is impossible to reconstruct someone's mental state based upon scant historical records, PTSD is a strong possibility for many of the afflicted persons, as several had witnessed family members being killed, and some had been captured and taken to Canada, where they were redeemed for cash or freed in prisoner swaps. And some say signs of sexual abuse were present in some testimony, such as that of Mary Warren about her relationship with John Proctor, who also allegedly referred to her as his jade, a term for an inferior or worn-out horse. Many other people whom we don't think of as afflicted were troubled by nightmares and sleep paralysis. There's no one-size-fits-all explanation for the afflictions. A variety of theories have been proposed, but many don't hold water. And I think we should focus more on why the people were willing to believe the accusations against their friends, family, and neighbors. So why don't we spend some more time considering the supposedly rationally thinking adults and less on the kids who are clearly occupying a different mental space? Understanding the actions of the colony's leaders and the accusers is critical to learning the lessons we need to learn from the witch trials. We have to understand the true fear of witchcraft, Satan, and utter destruction that was experienced by the people involved. We have to identify when and how fear overcame reason and the rush to judgment that followed. If there weren't really witches, why did people confess, as at least 54 did? Well, there are various theories on this as well. Many believe that confessions came from the desire for self-preservation through a belief that those who confessed would be spared. However, before Salem, Those who confessed were still hanged. Ultimately, several of the Salem confessors would also be condemned, and one would hang. Some will note that Samuel Wardwell, who confessed and hanged, did in fact retract his confession. But the very same court session that condemned him also condemned other confessors, though their hangings were delayed until 1693. In reality, the confessors were valuable witnesses for the prosecution often confirming previous allegations and sometimes supplying new names. They were likely kept alive with the intention that they would continue to testify against other suspects. However, Chief Justice of the Court of Oyer and Terminer and the Superior Court of Judicature, Lieutenant Governor William Stoughton, signed a death warrant for eight individuals on January 14, 1693. This list included six confessors. We do know that Elizabeth Proctor and Mary Bradbury were to be joined by confessors Elizabeth Johnson Jr., Mary Post, Sarah Wardwell, Abigail Hobbs, Abigail Faulkner, and Dorcas Hoare. These six confessors were said to have been slated for execution on February 1st, but Governor Phipps reprieved them and the others on January 31st. Stoughton was very angry. So angry he walked off the job. He said, We were in a way to have cleared the land of these. Who it is obstructs the cause of justice, I know not. But thereby the kingdom of Satan is advanced. The Lord have mercy on this country. Former Deputy Governor Thomas Danforth took over as Chief Justice of the Superior Court, which continued to meet periodically to review witchcraft cases in the counties of the accused. 
Though the court continued until May, no more suspects were convicted, and all were released once they could pay their jail fees. Unfortunately, Lydia Dustin could not pay her fees and died in jail, despite having been acquitted of all charges. Every one of those eight last condemned was a woman or girl, and 14 of the 19 actually executed were women. 75% of those accused were women or girls. More than 83% of those convicted were women or teen girls. As we alluded to earlier, evaluating the individuals who were accused reveals another interesting pattern. Half the men and boys accused were named following an accusation of a female closely related to them through blood or marriage. The men convicted had violated the unofficial 17th century Puritan code of behavior in various ways. John Willard was accused of domestic violence, and John Proctor threatened to beat one of the afflicted girls. Samuel Wardwell was a known fortune teller. George Jacob Sr. had once been fined for beating a man. George Burroughs had allegedly violated the office of minister by failing to baptize his own children, possibly indicating Baptist tendencies. Giles Corey, the man pressed to death with stones for refusing to agree to be tried by God and country, had once killed a neurodivergent man. Regardless of these alleged offenses, the men did not deserve to die for witchcraft, a crime we can be assured they never attempted in the way it was viewed then. None of them deserved to die. We mentioned spectral evidence and other overturned legal precedents earlier, and we'd like to elaborate now. Spectral evidence was a testimony claiming that witches' shapes had been encountered away from their bodies. The belief that was that witches could essentially astrally project themselves to distant locations and do mischief while their bodies were otherwise engaged, whether that was sleeping, giving testimony, or anything in between. And witches weren't the only specters being seen, as several people testified to seeing ghosts of witchcraft victims. Beyond the acceptance of spectral evidence, several other factors caused the witch hunt to grow and spread. For one thing, the courts did not require complainants to pay bonds of surety to ensure that they would faithfully prosecute the case and to avoid frivolous accusations. Without this bond requirement, individuals could and did file multiple complaints and or complain about multiple suspects at once. Another factor was the confessions wherein the number of witches reported in the colony continued to expand exponentially throughout the spring and summer. Following Titiba's accusation specifying a total of nine witches, further testimony and confession would increase the number into the dozens and then the hundreds. Anne Foster increased the number to 305 on July 15th, and William Barker said there were 307 on August 29th. Individual witch meetings in Andover were said to host over 200 witches who came to that town and Salem Village from as far away as Connecticut. While some testimony was exotic and occult, much was mundane, farm and household business. Witches bewitched livestock and food, stole milk, bad weather damaged crops, beer spoiled and leaked out of barrels. We'll be meeting a whole lot of people in the series. To begin with, let's talk about the people at the center of the initial accusations. The Salem Village Parsonage, at the center of the community, was occupied by the minister, Samuel Paris, his wife, Elizabeth, their children, Thomas, Betty, and Susanna, Paris's niece, Abigail Williams, and two enslaved indigenous people, John Indian and Titiba. Samuel Paris was Salem Village's fourth minister but the first to be ordained and allowed to perform sacraments now that the village parish was made a full church in 1689. The three prior ministers had all left amid serious disagreements over whether they should remain in their posts. We'll have much more on Paris and all these characters in future episodes. At the time Betty and Abigail were taken with fits, Samuel Paris was about 38 years old. Elizabeth, his wife, was 43. Abigail was 11. Betty was nine, Thomas was about 10, and Susanna was an infant. Titiba was likely in her 20s. No age can be established for John. The family of Sergeant Thomas Putnam was key in filing complaints against supposed witches, 
and Thomas recorded many of the depositions. His wife, Anne, and his daughter, also Anne, were both afflicted and accused many people. Thomas Putnam's brother, Edward Putnam, was one of the deacons of the Salem Village Church. Along with his brother Thomas, Joseph Hutchinson, and Thomas Preston, he filed the initial complaints against Tituba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne. Joseph Hutchinson, my 10th great-grandfather, was the man who donated the land for the village meeting house. He would later go on to testify against an afflicted person for lying and would also sign a petition in defense of Rebecca Nurse. Thomas Preston may have joined the others in complaining against the first three suspects, but he soon changed his tune when his mother-in-law, Rebecca Nurse, was accused. Judges and magistrates involved in the witch trial include John Hathorn, Jonathan Corwin, John Higginson Jr., and Bartholomew Gedney of Salem, plus William Stoughton, John Richards, Samuel Sewell, White Still Winthrop, Nathaniel Saltonstall, Peter Sargent, Dudley Bradstreet, Thomas Wade, John Fisk, John Foster, and Thomas Danforth. George Corwin and George Herrick were the prominent law enforcement officers, but many constables made arrests. George Corwin, nephew of the magistrate Jonathan Corwin, became the sheriff of Essex County under the new charter. George Herrick had been marshal under the old charter and remained on as a deputy under Corwin. We've mentioned Royal Governor William Phipps. He was born in Maine and had made a fortune as a treasure hunter. Many ministers played roles in the witch hunt. We've already talked about Samuel Paris, but other ministers involved include Nicholas Noyes and John Higginson, senior of Salem, Increase Mather, his son Cotton Mather, and Samuel Willard of Boston, John Hale of Beverly, Francis Dane, and Thomas Barnard of Andover, and many, many others. Salem State University history professor Emerson Baker has identified 50 of the accused as ministers, their family members, or their kin. The victims of the Salem witch hunt are too many to name here, but the executed were Bridget Bishop, Sarah Good, Rebecca Nurse, Sarah Wilds, Susanna Martin, Elizabeth Howe, John Proctor, George Burroughs, George Jacobs Sr., John Willard, Martha Carrier, Mary Esty, Martha Corey, Alice Parker, Mary Parker, Ann Pewterter, Wilmot Red, Margaret Scott, Samuel Wardwell, and Giles Corey, who was pressed to death with stones in an attempt to get him to consent to trial by God and country. A list of all the victims is linked in the show notes. The witch hunt ultimately ended after opposition mounted over the course of the year. The justices had consulted with the ministers, particularly Cotton Mather. The ministers urged caution, especially regarding spectral evidence. But Cotton ended their letter of advice by asking for the speedy and vigorous prosecutions of such as have rendered themselves obnoxious. In June, William Milborn had submitted a petition against spectral evidence. He was promptly arrested for framing, contriving, writing, and publishing the said seditious and scandalous papers or writings. Later in the summer, other opponents began to write anonymous letters and pamphlets, which began to circulate. They had to be careful, though, as those who opposed the witch hunt were seen as being in league with Satan and his witches. As summer became fall, the opposition became more vocal. In October, Thomas Brattle circulated a letter critiquing the trials, and Increase Mather published a book urging caution and invalidating spectral evidence. His son Cotton, however, published a book praising the justices of the court, a book that amounted to little more than propaganda for the court of Oyer and Terminer. Nevertheless, the tide had finally turned against the witch hunt and Governor Phipps shut down the court of Oyer and Terminer in late October 1692. Perhaps the afflicted persons had gone too far in naming people well above their station, including possibly the wife of the governor and possibly the wife of Increase Mather. Maybe the large number of executions had simply soured people's stomachs. Robert Califf reported that there was nearly a riot upon the execution of Minister George Burroughs until Cotton Mather calmed the crowd. But most importantly, the witch hunt had reached critical mass. At the rate the accusations were coming in, the whole colony threatened to be divided into two camps, witches and accusers. The ministers had warned against using spectral evidence, but Cotton Mather 
contradicted them with his desire for the trials to proceed vigorously. And Chief Justice Stoughton had insisted upon accepting spectral evidence, as had Hathorne and Corwin in the preliminary examinations and testimonies. And anybody could claim to see anyone else's specter, regardless of where the person's body actually was. As was written in a 1711 act to reverse the attainder on several victims' estates, this evidence had caused a prosecution to be had of persons of known and good reputation. Let's talk about the legacy of the Salem witch hunt. Witch hunts didn't end with Salem, not even in the American colonies. People continued to fear malefic witchcraft, as many do today. In some cases, the supposed witches sued their accusers for defamation. In other cases, cases offenders were simply dealt with out of the courts, with extrajudicial assaults and killings. As Owen Davies told us in episode 53, Owen Davies on grimoires, magic, and witch hunts. I've written America Witched, which is a book about all the people who were basically shot dead, beaten up, and slandered through the 19th and into the mid-20th century. America headline there is, you know, there were more people who were killed as witches after Salem than they were executed by the authorities. Even though literal witch hunts continue, the term witch hunt itself has become a byword used casually by politicians to describe any sort of investigation. Where the term witch hunt, in its literal sense, is appropriate mostly for vulnerable people, it has been co-opted by the rich and powerful to silence critics and deceive the masses. We call upon politicians and other leaders to take action against real witch hunts and stop declaring themselves to be victims of witch hunts of their own making. The Salem witch trials have appeared in pop culture and written works about the Salem witch trials as early as 1692 and have continued to this day without interruption. Today, thousands of titles are available. The Salem witch trials have been portrayed in every form of art imaginable, from TV and movies to paintings and digital art, from plays and ballets to songs and operas. The Salem story has been adapted to every art and entertainment medium. Salem is also remembered through several memorials. Two in Salem are dedicated to those hanged or pressed to death, while one in Danvers includes those names and the names of the people known to have died in jail while locked up on suspicion of witchcraft. Additionally, several memorials in other communities are dedicated to local victims. The oldest of these is the Rebecca Nurse Memorial in the Nurse Family Cemetery on the Rebecca Nurse Homestead, where Rebecca is believed to be buried in an unmarked grave. The memorial was dedicated in 1885. Much more recently, the remains of a person believed to be accused, which George Jacob Sr., have also been interred in an undisclosed location on the homestead. Just last year, a section of Interstate 495 was named the Susanna North Martin Memorial Highway. The most visited remembered site is the Salem Witch Trials Memorial in downtown Salem. But you should also visit the Proctor's Ledge Memorial at the site where the victims are believed to have been hanged. And don't forget the Witchcraft Victims Memorial in Danvers, formerly Salem Village. You can also find individual memorials for Susanna Martin, Wilmot Red, Giles and Martha Corey, and Mary Bradbury. Visit SalemWitchMuseum.com and take the 1692 online sites tour for more on these locations. Exonerations have been another way of remembering the victims. The first victims were cleared in 1703, and Elizabeth Johnson Jr. is the most recent exoneree. She was finally cleared on July 28, 2022. Elizabeth is the final convicted person of the Salem witch trials to be exonerated, but none of the accused have received apologies, and little has been done to honor those unconvicted victims who still suffered through often lengthy jail stays and sometimes the loss of other family members to hanging. Today, the Massachusetts Witch Hunt Justice Project urges you to sign the petition at change.org slash witch trials to obtain exoneration for Massachusetts witch trial victims who were tried in Boston in the decades before Salem and an apology to all witch trial victims, including the Salem victims, for many ways in which they and their families suffered. 
There are also annual remembrance events and descendant reunions. Countless descendants carry on the living legacy of the witch hunt. Given that over 1,400 names are included in records of the Salem witch hunt, and descendants of each person who had children now number well into the thousands or tens of thousands, there must be tens of millions of descendants out there, if not more. Perhaps you are one. If you'd like to find out, listen to our March 16th, 2023 episode titled Finding Your Salem Witch Trail Ancestors with David Allen Lambert. We certainly see that tens of thousands have joined Facebook groups for descendants, and many people who have corresponded with us are descendants. If you are one or want to find out, we also host a Salem Witch Hunt discussion group where you can connect with us and learn more about the witch trials. We can and should take many lessons from the witch hunt. These lessons include things like don't let fear override reason and treat others better than you treat yourself. In other words, don't be so hard on people. Don't rush to judgment. Don't resent people for being parts of groups with different backgrounds or beliefs. Treat every human with dignity and respect. In this series, we will cover the people, places, and events of the Salem Witch Hunt, legal procedures, etc., etc. Stay tuned over the coming months and indeed years for many more episodes in our Salem Witch Hunt 101 series. If we didn't cover something or someone today, don't worry, we'll get to them. Thank you for listening to Salem Witch Hunt 101 Part 1 on Witch Hunt. Join us again for the ne next installment when we will cover many of the major events and turning points of the witch hunt. And watch our Salem Witch Hunt daily report videos. The link is in the show notes. Thank you. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow. Mm -hmm.